What is up YouTube? It's your boy Faridon here. Alright, so the purpose of this video is going to be to give some of you newcomers to the Mass Effect world a general idea of how the multiplayer works. I know this game has been out for a while. It came out in 2012, so a lot of you are wondering, well, why are you reviewing a six-year-old game? Well, there, a lot of the videos have gotten lost in the shuffle on YouTube, and you know, there's there's been quite a bit that's happened in the Mass Effect universe since then. So I kind of wanted to do like sort of an updated video for you guys, specifically for my friends. I know a couple of you are starting to get into the Mass Effect gaming franchise, so I just kind of wanted to just do like a thorough, comprehensive walkthrough and uh, give everybody an idea of what to expect if you've never played the Mass Effect multiplayer before. So this game right here is Mass Effect 3 multiplayer. Uh, it's a lot more primitive than, say, the Mass Effect Andromeda multiplayer. I feel like the Mass Effect Andromeda multiplayer definitely fixed pretty much all of the issues uh, that we experienced in Mass Effect 3. Mass Effect 3 was really clunky. Oh, and we lost our host. And see that that right there is a classic example of one of the things that they did wrong with the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer. In the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer, the host of the lobby became the host of the match. And so if they were disconnected during the course of the game, it wouldn't necessarily kick you out of the game, but it would reset whatever wave you were on. And if you were like literally at the very end of the wave and you guys like gave it your all and you used a bunch of your, you know, your consumables or whatever, uh, you did not get those consumables back. It didn't undo what you did. It just uh, started the wave over again with all the all the enemies and everything, so it made it a real pain in the butt. So yeah, I basically just joined this game, it looks like, on wave three, and uh, the host decided to leave, so it starts over, uh, and now there's only three of us. But anyways, okay, so the Mass Effect multiplayer, it definitely evolved in Andromeda. It was so fluid, so smooth, uh, that I, I really don't have any complaints at all. I mean, there's a few, a few personal preferences. You know, I could talk about about Mass Effect Andromeda's multiplayer. I'm not even going to get into the the campaign because I think we all know where that would go. <laughs> but uh, so for the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer here, I'm playing as one of the adept class characters. A lot like the Andromeda multiplayer, you get all these different uh, characters to choose from because there's so many powers in the game. And so what they do is they select three powers presets, basically, for each of the characters. And they generally try to have one main power that defines that class, and then they select two other powers that complement that main power. Uh, sometimes they're active powers, meaning you can, like, you cast them and they do damage. Others are passive, where you activate them and they just kind of stay on and they augment you in some way. Maybe they make your weapons fire faster, maybe they make your other powers more powerful maybe they you know give you some sort of health buff or armor buff whatever and then as you level up that character class you're given attribute points that you get to allocate however you want amongst the three powers as well as a passive attribute tree and another tree that is devoted to health and shields or melee abilities now you also get like I said weapons and the weapons are broken down into five classes You've got your sniper rifles, your assault rifles, your uh, submachine guns, your pistols, and your shotguns. And I'll get more into those in a little bit. And then, to sort of break down the way the powers work, you've got two main classes of powers. You've got biotic powers, which are more natural, more organic. Uh, if you read the lore of the game, basically, they are as a result of people being exposed to this Element Zero stuff, which is what they use in the FTL drives of the ships to allow them to travel at the speed of light. Um, and when people are exposed to it, a lot like mercury, it gets absorbed into their body, but then they learned how to manipulate it um, to, to do powers, basically. And then the tech powers are more, are more technology-based powers, you know, like a flamethrower, uh, a proxy like a combat drone, or the decoy. So those are the two main types of powers. And like I said, each one, they have more active powers that can actually, uh, you know, inflict damage on the enemy. And then they have others that are uh, passive that just basically augment your, your defenses in some way. But essentially the way it works here in the Mass Effect 3 multiplayer is there's six player classes. Those are the six types, really the main types of characters you can choose from. You've got the Adepts. The Adepts are biotic specialists. They tend to be a little more on the squishy side. 
but they can do you know a lot of damage if you work together with other players who are playing as the adepts and some of them actually do have the power set up to do massive amounts of damage and biotic explosions on their own so and that's uh, detonations and setting up a detonation that's something i'll get into in a little bit but because they're so squishy and their their powers do lots of damage um, when you play as an adept class typically you want to go with lighter weight weapons uh, or like one semi-heavy weapon Reason being that weapon weight will affect how quickly or how slowly your powers recharge in this game. So characters like any of the characters from the Adept class that are very uh, power focused, you typically don't want to overburden your character with uh, heavy weapons. Unless, of course, you're starting with a level 1 character and you need the weapons to sort of make your character survivable in the multiplayer. Okay, moving on, the Soldier class. The Soldier class is uh, more suited for all weapons types. They do have powers, but they are not as affected by the weight of weapons. Also, they do have powers that augment weapons, such as increasing rate of fire, increasing damage, increasing accuracy over distance, stuff like that. All right, next up, engineers. The engineer class is a heavily tech specialized class. Um, as far as survivability, their health and shields are sort of in between the squishy adept class and the tanky soldier class. They're not really, you know, more towards one or the other. So they, they can take a few hits, but again, you do need to play smart, especially on some of the higher difficulties like gold or platinum. You can't just run and gun all the time. You do need to be smart about your attacks and stick to cover quite a bit. The engineers typically get, uh, not all of them have one, but most of them have a proxy. Now, this can be a combat drone, which I like to affectionately refer to as a floating beach ball of death. <laughs> and it's basically this drone that floats around and it goes to the enemy and you know it's got a shock attack or a stun attack and then it's also if you upgrade it fully you can get a missile attack where it launches a, a little homing missile from a distance. Some of them get an attack turret or a combat turret which is exactly like it sounds it just you throw it out wherever it lands that's where it stays but it can pivot a full 360 degrees and fire. Uh, and in those typically you can you can uh, max them out to either have also a missile launcher or uh, flamethrower which is really convenient if you if you drop it close by because as enemies get closer you can actually use the flames to set up a fiery explosion and then have somebody detonate it for you all right the sentinel class the sentinel class basically is is sort of a jack of all trades an amalgam of both tech and biotic abilities so the Sentinel class really rewards you for being a team player. Some of you who are new to the game might find them a bit challenging to solo with. So if you are playing by yourself, I don't know if the Sentinel class is for you, but until you start locking a lot of the better weapons, I find the Soldier class and the Sentinel class to be a little bit more challenging to use, especially if you're going to be soloing. I typically recommend more the Engineer class for beginners because although they aren't very tanky, they do give you some pretty good powers right off the bat uh, without that added squishiness of the adepts or the uh, need for precision and accuracy that the vanguards require. All right, now the infiltrator class. The infiltrator class is a very interesting class. It is a class that definitely rewards people with skill and a lot of experience in this game. Uh, typically, they're all their ability is to go invisible. They cloak and. Uh, kind of like the soldier class where they have the adrenaline rush or marksman to help improve your weapon abilities, uh, your weapon attacks. The infiltrator class actually has a uh, option for your cloak when you go invisible that uh, increases damage of sniper rifles which is great for people who like to snipe from a distance because this makes you basically a one, one hit kill if you're really good with a sniper rifle and you know exactly where the weak points are on the enemies. I just want to also note the importance of this character class for playing on Platinum. Now, when you're playing on Platinum, first of all, it doesn't really matter what enemies you select because you're going to get three enemies spawning at the same time. In other words, you're not just going to get Cerberus if you select Cerberus, you're also going to get two other enemy types. Typically, if you play on Reaper, you avoid the Geth stagger problem, which is horrendous on Platinum. The Geth Primes and their Siege Pulses will literally cripple an entire team. So, playing on Platinum, typically we would select Reaper. That seems to be the easiest route to get through it. But the importance of the Infiltrator class is that uh, people like to stay stationary on Platinum. You pick one good spot to hold down the map and then you just stay there. Uh, transitioning can sometimes get you into a lot of trouble. 
but with the infiltrator if you have an infiltrator on your team on platinum when you're doing things like the objective waves that person can then cloak get across the map relatively unscathed and get to the objective and, and at least get it started while everybody else tries to transition or find a way to get around the enemies and to where they need to go all right and finally on the list is the vanguard class the vanguard class is a bit tricky as kind of like adepts they are usually very biotic based and can be kind of squishy. Actually, they're, most of them, except for the Krogans, are very squishy. But their one redeeming factor is the biotic charge will reward you for a successful biotic charge by replenishing your shields. I mean, according to the lore of the game, this is essentially where they would create a, a warp field around themselves of zero mass, and then they start running. And because they weigh next to nothing, they can start running super, super fast, and sort of like Juggernaut from the Marvel Universe, they just slam straight into their target at the last minute they will give themselves all their mass back so they hit with full force and this will knock opponents back uh, on the ground and the beauty of it is they can detonate biotic powers this way so if, if uh, the enemy is say hit with warp or reeve or something like that and then somebody biotic charges them it can cause a biotic detonation which does massive amounts of damage on top of the actual attack all right, now that I've given you the skinny on how the Mass Effect multiplayer works and how it's broken down, let's go ahead and get into my tactics here. So this character here is the Awakened Collector. He is an adept. And essentially, his powers are Seeker Swarm, Dark Channel, and Dark Sphere. Dark Sphere is a power that you can throw out. It's the green orb you see me throwing out there. And what it does is it sticks to whatever it touches and stays there until it runs out and uh, it, it, any, any enemy that walks through it or that it hits will begin taking immediate damage. Now you can detonate it to cause additional damage immediately or you can leave it out there so that it, like if you want to mine a doorway uh, any enemies that walk through that doorway will then begin taking damage as they walk through the sphere. Dark Channel is a lot like Reeve or Warp in that it does damage over time and it can actually set up a biotic explosion. And Seeker Swarm is the power causing those three orbs to orbit around you there, you see. When they're active, you can spec them out to give you additional damage resistance and they can also detonate biotic explosions. So essentially what you'll see me do is at the beginning of every wave I'll make sure I've got all three of those orbs floating around me. If not, I may throw them out real quick, whatever, however many I have left, and then I will uh, replenish them, and you'll see him throw his hand up in the air, and he sort of does this little dance, and suddenly he's got the three glowing orbs around him again. This ensures that not only do I have all three rounds ready to go in case I need to detonate some biotic explosions, but also all three orbs means I have the maximum possible damage resistance available to me. So as you throw each of the orbs out, you reduce your bonus damage resistance. So once I've got my Seeker Swarm up, then it becomes a matter of which powers do I use and in what order. Usually I will always throw out the Dark Sphere first once the enemies start moving in, and I'll try and throw it at a spot on the ground where I know the enemies are going to be funneled to, or forced to walk over it. This can be a doorway, this can be a set of stairs or a ramp. The reason why I do Dark Sphere first is because of the three powers, it's the only one whose recharge time is almost instantaneous as long as you do not detonate the Dark Sphere. If you detonate the Dark Sphere, it suddenly becomes the longest recharge time of your three powers. But as long as you don't detonate it, you're good to go for your second power. Next, I choose a target and I'll throw out Dark Channel. Now you can stack this power onto one of the enemies who's already affected by your Dark Spheres, or you can pick to throw it at one of the enemies that maybe missed your Dark Sphere. Next, I'll throw out one of my Seeker Swarms to one of the enemies that is already primed by either Dark Sphere or Dark Channel, causing a biotic detonation. And then finally, I'll go ahead and detonate my Dark Sphere. This does massive amounts of damage and can clear out a room. Since the Awakened Collector is an adept, I like to keep his weapons loadout as light as possible. Typically, I use the Collector SMG because he is a collector and so he gets an added damage bonus. Also, I'll use the Acolyte Pistol. Now, the Acolyte Pistol is not the easiest pistol to use. It does need to be charged and because its projectile fires so slowly, it actually arcs much like an arrow. But if you can master the Acolyte Pistol, it does massive amounts of bonus damage against shields and barriers. With the Heavy Barrel Upgrade option on it, it becomes an effective weapon against shields and barriers even on Platinum difficulty. So right here you see me switching back to my Acolyte Pistol, that's because I see a Banshee coming at me with barriers. And I'm getting grabbed, oh my goodness. 
I hate face humpers. These guys suck. They used to be humans, and now they're these... Oh! See, that's why I hate them. They stagger your character and they lock you in place. Anyways, what I would do is I like to switch to the Acolyte Pistol when I know there's an enemy coming at me with lots of shields and barriers. Uh, this might be Banshees from the Reapers, uh, it could be Praetorians, you know, it, it could be Collector Captains, it could be Phantoms from Cerberus, it could be Atlases. I mean, there's really a lot of enemies in this game that have shields or barriers that become really easy to beat once you break down their shields and barriers. So that usually becomes my priority, taking down the, their defenses and that opens them up to attack from everybody else in the lobby. Unfortunately, I think right here, uh, we're duoing this because even even the third guy just decided to leave, or maybe he got disconnected, I'm not quite sure. All I know is uh, our, our lobby emptied out pretty quickly, and now we're left here to fend for ourselves. And also, I apologize ahead of time, guys. I know some of you uh, N7 veterans out there that play this game a lot, or have played this game a lot, you probably noticed some of the uh, mistakes that I'm making here. Uh, this is, in my defense, this is my first game in well over a year, probably closer to two years. So uh, I was kind of trying to shake the rust off a little bit and get back into the swing of things. Also, I was not playing on my Xbox One here. This is actually footage I recorded while playing on my old Xbox 360. Okay, so here I am not retreating. I am tactically repositioning myself <laughs> to give me a chance to regenerate my barriers and uh, reload, which is something you have to do quite often, especially on gold and platinum. Yeah, I hate these little face humpers. Okay, so there we go, wave complete. So uh, these little flashing boxes you keep seeing me run up to, guys, those are the ammo boxes. They will replenish your weapon ammo as well as your grenades if you have grenades as a power. Oh my goodness, two banshees. Okay, so again, I switch to my acolytes, start taking out those barriers so that it opens them up to uh, different attacks by my ally here. Oh, getting hit. One of the things you got to pay attention to is if you see weapon fire coming from behind you because that means you've got enemies in front and behind and you need to find suitable cover before you end up going down. Alright, there's another shielded enemy, so I'm going to be trying to take down his shield as quickly as possible. A lot of these smaller enemies, I might not necessarily take the time to switch to the Acolyte Pistol simply because it, uh, it takes too much downtime. It's easier to just take out their shields quickly by casting a power and shooting at them. And the thing to remember is a lot of these enemies uh, actually can regenerate shields if you stop your attack and start running too much. For Cerberus, the Atlases can actually be repaired by the engineers running around. They can repair their shields. They'll, they'll stand really close to them as they're walking and start replenishing their shields. The Banshees, when they do that uh, high-pitched scream, that's usually when they regenerate some of their barrier, which you then have to take down again. So really the most efficient way to take down the Banshees is to strip down their barriers as quick as possible and then start hitting them with everything you got to take down their armor as quickly as possible because uh, they'll regenerate their barrier and then you got to take the barrier back down again before you can start doing any actual damage to them. So that should be your plan of attack, you know. First, go after those barriers and shields. Once you get those down, switch weapons, and then try to do as much damage as you can to their armor. And you can tell what kind of defenses an enemy's got, uh, simply by highlighting them with your reticle. If you see a red bar above them, that means that they are completely unshielded. All they've got is their health. If you see a yellow bar, that's armor. So you know immediately you'd be better off attacking them with some sort of uh, armor debuff, power, and or uh, armor piercing rounds. If you see a blue bar, that means that the enemy has shields, which you can still take down any way you want, but the more effective way to take down shields is, is with powers like Energy Drain or Overload, also ammo mods like Disruptor Rounds. And finally, purple means barriers, which is most effectively taken down by things like Warp, Reeve, and Biotic Detonations. But really, that's just if you're looking for the most efficient way to take them down. Your best bet is just to spam them with everything you've got. Oh, and another thing I wanted to point out. I know I'm trying to cram a bunch of stuff into just a, a very basic how-to video for you guys, but there's there's quite a few things that I wanted to touch base on so that you have a general understanding again uh, before going in. And that is uh, with powers. Remember I said at the beginning there were two kinds of powers. There are biotic and techs. They tend to override each other. So if you've got two people with tech powers and two people on the team with biotic powers, and you're all spamming your powers, they technically override each other. So if you're trying to set up for tech explosions or biotic explosions, 
uh, you know, that's one thing to keep in mind if you see your tech buddies throwing powers at the enemy, let them do their thing, and then as soon as they're they're done and they're waiting for their powers to recharge, then come in and, and do yours as well. And that carries over to ammo mod. In the lobby menu, if you go to equipment, it allows you to put on four different types of equipment. One of them is ammo mods. And you really want to pick one that's going to complement whatever powers your character has because you can actually sabotage yourself and override. So if you're using a character with biotic powers, you want to pick something like warp, which will really complement your powers, or something that's neutral like drill rounds or even armor piercing rounds. Those are really the only ones you want to use. If you're using a tech-based character, you want to stay away from warp, but it's still okay to use drill rounds and armor piercing. Even better would be incendiary ammo, cryo ammo, disruptor rounds, anything that's going to sabotage the enemy with a tech-based mod to the ammo. And that way, you will be doing the most amount of damage you can possibly do. Next, I wanted to talk about how each match is structured. There are a total of 11 waves in every match. Waves 1 and 2, waves 4 and 5, and waves 7, 8, and 9 are all survival waves. The only thing you need to worry about is surviving the onslaught of enemies. Waves 3, 6, and 10, however, are objective waves. If you're playing on one of the lower difficulty levels like bronze or silver, and I think this applies to gold as well, every third wave is a boss wave. And what that means is, while waves 1 and 2 might be a little bit easier to help you get your feet wet, waves 3, 6, and 9 are going to be the waves where they're going to definitely throw everything at you, including the kitchen sink. So you're going to be facing definitely, you know, depending on your, your enemies, uh, atlases, phantoms, brutes, banshees, geth primes, and then from the collectors would be the scions and the praetorians, aka the deadly space crabs. Uh, <laughs> again, that, that applies to every third wave, so waves 3, 6, and 9. And lastly, wave 11 is going to be your survival extraction wave. Now this is literally the end-all be-all jubilee of waves. No objectives other than survive and be in the circle when the timer reaches zero. You get super bonuses to your XP and to your credits received for having all four players or however many people are in the lobby in that circle and, and not have them be dead or executed or even standing just outside the circle. That can literally take off experience points and credits for. So definitely make sure you've got everybody on your team in that circle when the timer reaches zero. All right, now I kind of skipped over the objective wave explanation, so let's go ahead and explain what an objective wave is now. On the objective waves, the team is given a specific objective to complete. There are essentially five different types of objectives. There is a hack or upload objective in which a circle is randomly placed on the map. You must stand inside the circle until the upload or hack is complete. The more of your teammates that stand inside the circle, the faster that hack or upload takes place. So it rewards you for working as a team to complete your objective. Next are devices. On a devices objective wave, the game will randomly spawn a device on the map. The objective here is for one player to activate the device while the others cover him. Receiving damage while activating or deactivating a device may interrupt your progress and make you start over. The game will spawn them one at a time in random places throughout the map. Next up, object retrieval. On an object retrieval wave, the game will spawn an object at a random location in the map which you will then have to go pick up and carry to a designated drop-off zone. Be careful as you will not be able to run or dodge while carrying the object or else you will drop it. Once you've captured the first object, then it will spawn a second one also in a random place which you will then have to pick up and carry to the designated drop-off zone. Next up, Escort. On an Escort wave, the game will randomly spawn a drone on the map. You will then have to activate that drone and escort it to its destination. The speed at which the drone travels is determined by how many players are standing within its proximity. The minute you step out of its proximity, it will begin to slow down. It's also worth noting that the escort drone will actually augment your defenses while you are standing within its proximity to aid you in getting it to its target. And finally, eliminate target. On an eliminate target wave, the game will randomly select one enemy at a time for you to eliminate specifically. Eliminate all four targets to complete the objective and then finish off the enemies to complete the wave. One final heads up about objective waves. 
they're typically timed. So the faster you get them done, the more rewards you get at the end of the match. These rewards are both in the form of XP and in-game credits. Oh, I melted that banshee. See, never underestimate the power of damage over time. That was one of the hardest things for me to transition to when I started playing Mass Effect. I was so used to games that instantly reward you with, you know, enemy death or massive uh, health loss as soon as you cast a power or shoot your weapon. Whereas in Mass Effect, it's more of, uh, you know, cast your power, let it do damage over time, and back away, and let the power do its work. And I find that that was actually, once I realized that that's how the game mechanic worked, it began to make more sense to me. Wave 10. Okay, wave 10 is definitely going to be an objective wave. And it is eliminate targets again, which we had earlier on wave 6. Now, me being the dummy that I am, I wasted all my missiles earlier, but if I had saved any, it would have made this wave a lot more fun. One of the cheat ways that my friends and I like to get through this particular objective is basically just run around like a bunch of idiots with our rockets and take out all four targets as quickly as possible. This ensures both that we save time on the mission and also that we get as much bonus XP and credits as possible. I know for many of you it might be hard to charge in like this and to go after the targets, especially when they're surrounded by a bunch of smaller minions all trying to shoot you and kill you. But unfortunately there is no way around the fact that you just have to go after the targets first since there is a time limit. In this respect, it actually worked out to our advantage that the target is a banshee because they move around pretty quickly, teleporting through obstacles and walls. So luckily we don't have to go through these brutes, we can just work on them while the banshee makes its way over to us. Oh, and I went down. Yeah, see, unfortunately, there's going to be times where you're just going to have to try and uh, circumvent the whole mosh pit here and try and get to those targets. So sometimes you just gotta bite the bullet and uh, run all the way around the outside of the map and hope that you can get to the uh, selected target in time. Here I'm tactically repositioning myself further back to allow my powers to recharge, my weapons to reload. Oh, those Banshee Warps are brutal. One of the things that you learn how to do is you learn the animations of the enemies and you learn how they telegraph what they're about to do. If I had played this more, I would have been able to tell that, that the Banshee was about to throw a warp at me. Lucky for me, the teammate that I'm dueling with here is on the ball and is able to correct my mistake. Okay, and it looks like I'm gonna have to get myself up on this one and spend one of my revives. Now, I know it's probably your first inclination to go run over there and revive your down teammate, but considering that we've got a bunch of heavies around us right now, I mean, even if I somehow survive making it through them to get to my teammate to revive them, there's a good chance that they'll just turn around and get sink killed as soon as they get up, and I've actually had that happen quite a few times. So to play it safe, I'm going to kite the enemies around the map by making them follow me to leave my teammate uh, alone and unattended, so that hopefully I'll be able to make my way back in time and revive them. And here, luckily, it looks like my allies still had another revive themselves, so they were able to get themselves up once I took the heavies away from them. Now, to save myself a bunch of pain and agony here, I probably should have simply kept tactically repositioning myself further back, but I hesitated for a second while I was trying to decide what I should do, considering that I'm out of rockets and I appear to be out of first aid kits. Oh, and it looks like my ally got executed anyway, so it didn't really make much of a difference. Okay, so now I have to change up my tactics quite a bit because I'm the only one left up in the lobby. If I go down and die, then we lose the match, along with all of our bonuses. So now my two main priorities are to stay alive and to eliminate the last target. And the best way to do both of those things is to continue to be aware of my surroundings, meaning know where I'm at in the map, and then continue to tactically reposition myself further and further back, and allow the enemies to keep coming to me. Alright, with less than a minute left on the clock, I really need to focus on taking out this last target to make sure we at least get paid for this wave, even if I don't make it. Since it's only a slow-moving armored target, I think I'm in a pretty good spot. 
I don't have to worry about any shields or barriers regenerating on me while I back away. Essentially, all I have to do is keep spamming my powers and hope that they do their job in time. Hey, Dirt. Alright, with the last target down, now all I gotta do is keep backing away and working on these last few enemies. There is no more time limit. And that's one of the things I wanted to emphasize, is once you complete the objective and you no longer have a time limit, that should be a huge weight off your shoulders. Because now you can just kind of sit back, take your time, play smart, don't do anything stupid, don't try to hurry things up, you're not rushed anymore to get things done. So I'm just going to avoid getting surrounded there by continuing to transition to different areas of the map. Allow the enemies to clump back together. Luckily I'm in a pretty good position for the final wave, the extraction wave. I know it might not look like it considering I don't have any more med kits or rockets, but I still do have three revives left. So essentially what you can do, even if you're the only one left standing, is just continue to transition around the map from cover to cover. If you go down, wait till the last possible minute to use one of your revives, and hopefully, before you have to use that last revive, the timer will be close to zero. And see right there, I saw that that Banshee was telegraphing that she was about to throw a warp out at me. So I immediately tapped A and to the right to uh, do a dodge behind cover. And that saved me from getting hit with another Banshee warp. One of the keys to tactically repositioning yourself, aka falling back or running away from the enemies, you guys got to kind of, you know, keep in mind that you do want to keep the pressure on the enemies because if all you're doing is running around the map, you're not really doing anything for yourself. You know, you're, it's one thing to be out of ammo and you want to run to a nearby ammo cache, but it's another thing entirely to just simply stop attacking the enemy because you're too busy running. You definitely want to keep doing damage, stop occasionally to turn around and just throw a power or two out at one enemy. Keep working on that one enemy if you know, if you know which one you're, you're attacking. Keep on that one enemy and what that will do is that will ensure that the one will go down and then you can focus on the next one, then you can focus on the next one and you kind of have to prioritize which one is the most dangerous to me, which one do I need to take care of right now. Um, obviously the Banshees are the biggest threat in the map against Reapers, followed very closely by those Ravagers because of their range and how quickly they can take down your defenses. All right, wave 10 complete. No more objectives. Now we're on the final wave, wave 11, which is the extraction wave. So now they just basically throw everything at you and the kitchen sink and expect you to survive. A tactic I find, especially on gold and platinum uh, for surviving the extraction wave, do not go to the extraction circle until I'd say the last 30 seconds of the map. Reason being the enemies always know where you are and if you stay in one spot, everyone's basically just gonna come bum rushing at you and so you want to give yourself that opening of it at the very last minute if you need to just book it across the map get to the extraction circle and then while the enemies are trying to chase after you you've got that little gap in the action where you can take a quick breath and hopefully survive long enough for the countdown timer to get to zero and have all four teammates on their feet I would like to send a special shout out to Suicide Twist here you see me duoing this gold match with. I had never played with this person before, but I couldn't ask for a better pug teammate as, uh, like I said, this was my first match in quite a while. I was really rusty. I uh, didn't know what to expect, but uh, having somebody with skills and experience and who did as well as this person did uh, really made the transition back into the game easy. And so thank you Suicide Twist if you're watching this video. I appreciated all your help and uh, I think over the next couple days I actually ended up playing with this person more and more uh, in completely random lobbies which was really cool because I started recognizing the name. Well that's my time everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into my gaming channel. I really appreciate the views and the likes and the comments. I'd also like to say thank you to everybody in the Mass Effect community for making it such a fun game to play over and over again so many years later. 
And now that we know there is yet another Mass Effect game in the works, we all have something to look forward to. I think my next video will be a comprehensive how-to guide for the Mass Effect Andromeda multiplayer, so please be sure to subscribe to my channel and stay tuned as I will have more content coming. If you're into motorcycles, please check out my moto vlog. I'll post the link down in the description. If you're looking for someone to game with and you play on Xbox, please feel free to add me. If you play on PC, I also happen to have profiles on Steam and Origin, spelled the exact same way as you see here on Xbox. Alright everyone, again thank you so much for stopping by my channel. I wish you all a very fun and safe holiday season. Stay safe and I'll catch you all in my next video. Peace! Simple black and white A soldier's heart within my soul Just tell me who to fight Glistening like stars above Explosions lead our way The pains I have will never fade Like the memories of the mess